Hello guys, welcome to AMZ Real Sellers Talk. Uh, today we have with us uh, Michelle, how do you say your last name, Michelle? Michelle Covey. Michelle Covey uh, from GS1 and I have with us uh, as well, Philip Jepson, uh, founder of Managed by Stats. And, uh, we're actually pretty excited to, to talk about this stuff because um, we've been hearing about GS1 codes for, for years and um, there's always a question from Amazon sellers of, you know, do I need this? Do I not need it? What, what, why do I need it? Um, why is it keeping, you know, brought up by Amazon? And, uh, you know, we, we thought, you know, let's, let's actually get the, uh, from the horse's mouth and, uh, get the real data. And, um, yeah, I think we should just jump right in and, and go through, uh, uh the questions that we have and, and, uh, see what we got. Yeah. Well, as you know, we, be, we both been selling for many years now. I started back in 2013 and, and, uh, GS1 certainly was available back then. Um, but it was not nearly as focused, I think on the, the small sellers and making it easy for new Amazon sellers to get in there. So I certainly started with non GS1, um, um, UPC codes and yes. all of that in the beginning, and uh, and you know when it it, it it became apparent that hey this is not really all that great of an idea, and you know so we switched over, and uh, so there's a lot of really good reasons, and and we're excited to have you here to tell us about that, and and let everybody kind of know how easy it is now, and what all the advantages are. Yeah, sounds great. Well, both Mark and Philip, thank you so much for having me today. I'm excited to help hopefully demystify all things around GS1 and barcodes and GTINs and standards, so. <laughs> Love it. So yeah, take us through. Um, I guess the, th the first question would be like, why, um, why would an Amazon seller want to use GS1 codes? Um, let's, let's take it from there. Okay. Well, so first of all, GS1, um, hopefully you know who GS1 is. Just as a quick overview, we are a standards organization. We're a global standards organization, and we really help in um, areas of product identification, uh, as well as other like location and asset location and help with business standards to help trading partners do business more efficiently. So that's really our role um, from a GS1 perspective. Um, I represent GS1 US and um, help a lot of the um, members in our community try to, like I said, demystify all things barcodes and why do you need them and why are they important? So um, Amazon, as you said earlier, you know, started in 2013. Amazon didn't have as many, um, I guess, stringent rules or guidance around product identification. Um, as you probably have noticed over the last several years, it's getting um, more and more important for Amazon to be able to uh, uniquely identify the products that are being sold on their marketplaces and their platforms. So uh, this is where GS1, this is, you know, what we're known well for is product identification. Um, and so they have relied on the standards that we have put into place um, and that are used globally for, for many years. So the UPC barcode is 50 years old and um, they're relying on that, that UPC or that product identifier to help uniquely identify. Um, I could go into more details, like um, what, what is the reason going with a GS1 versus there are um, other sources, um, but sometimes also people wanna know like what's the difference between a G10 and an EAN and a UPC and a barcode. So yes. which way do you want me to start? <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's great. Let's, let's get a clarification on what these codes are, what the difference is and stuff. Sure. So um, there's a lot of terms used out there and sometimes it can be very confusing. And even us in GS1, we tend to use them interchangeably, but there are some unique differences and nuances. So let me at least break down those. So GTIN, G-T-I-N, um, that stays, stands for a global trade item number. And really that's the unique number that is associated to a product. So think of it as like the license plate. So that's the identifying number. Um, there are several types of formats of GTINs. So there's a 12 digit, which gets encoded into a UPC barcode, but sometimes we all call it a UPC. Um, and so that's the 12 digit. And then the EAN, which is a, tw a 13 digit GTIN um, or a GTIN 13 is encoded into an EAN barcode. But um, commonly used on the Amazon platform, one of the first questions um, a, a seller is asked when they're listing a product is what's your product identifier? and pick one and it's either a GTIN, a UPC or an EAN. 
And um, this is a common error that we see a lot of members kind of question, what should I put here? It's, I think the, um, like if you use the wrong one, it's value specified is invalid or something like that. But you need to identify, like if you have the 12 digit, you put a UPC, if you have a 13 digit EAN, and then the 14 digit is the is the GTIN, and those are usually meant for case packs. So um, kind of all meant the same or used interchangeably, but there are some unique um, nuances there. Interesting. Wow. And the, the, the GTIN has typically a, a country code in front of it. Is that correct? So the way that they are um, constructed is um, each GS1 member organization. So we are uh, we have many GS1 member organizations around the globe. Um, so say GS1 US, we ad, um, administer GTINs out of a specific range that is, has been given to us from um, our global office. And so, yes, ours start with a certain number range. And whereas, say, maybe GS1 UK starts with a different name, number range and you know, other GS1 member organizations. So there is a little bit of logic there. Um, and it's just um, how we ma manage um, how each member organization can um, license out to their community. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. Awesome. Okay, that's, that's a good clarification. And so when, when someone's uh, getting started on Amazon or starting a product on Amazon, um, they're going to want to know what it is they want to do before they actually decide to you know, go with a, a UPC code or a GTN. Uh, they want to figure out what it is that they're going to want to go with, right? Well, I think it's just knowing what they have. So when, they, when members come to GS1 US, when we license them a, um, an identifier, we um, generally, if you come off of our website, will I license them that 12 digit G10? So um, that is traditionally what we license out of our member organization. Whereas if members go to other uh, GS1 organizations, say like GS1 UK or Brazil or, you know, Germany, they're generally the 13 digit EANs. So you just have to count the digits when you actually get your, <laughs> your, your G10. So, but we, like I said, the US, it's most commonly referred to as a UPC, even though um, it is technically a G10. <laughs> okay, cool. Okay, and then, yeah, why would one, why would a seller, um, what, like, what would be the importance or the value of an Amazon seller actually getting a, a GS1 code these days uh, as compared to just going online somewhere and buying a bunch of UPC codes? That's another great question. Um, and so there are other sources or claims uh, there are other sources out there that claim that they issue GS1 um, UPCs or, or G10s. Um, however, uh, GS1 does not, because of the way we are um, structured, we do not have um, agreements with trading partners for them or solution partners to um, issue GS1 uh, identifiers. So GS1 um, member organizations are the only entities that, that issue true GS1 identifiers. So if you see someone claiming they are, I kind of question that. Um, the reason why um, a lot of companies such as Amazon um, like to ha um, say go with a GS1 barcode is because we do ensure that that um, that the the seller or the the company that came to license that is truly the owner of that G10. So it's really for brand protection, um, for helping with counterfeit. Um, so we report in, in our database um, all of the seller or the, that member information. So that when Amazon does do a validation against that that G10, uh, it could say yes, Michelle did license that G10, and it belongs to Michelle's company, and so we know that she could actually um, list this product and be the rightful owner of it. So uh, we do have that database, and you'll see even on the Amazon uh, seller support, they say that they check all um, data against the GS1 database. So they they want to make sure that whoever owns that G10 is is the rightful owner. Okay, so then if someone's buying uh, UPC codes off the internet somewhere, uh, off of some random site, they potentially could be buying codes that actually belong to some other company. Yes, that's interesting. True. And uh, is, does the public have a way of looking up who the which company is is the owner of a particular UPC or G10? Yeah, so our database, the, the same database, it's called um, GAPIR. That's what I call it, um, some people in our company. But it's it's another one of those acronyms, um, G-E-P-I-R. It's in our, um, both on the GS1 US website, and it's also on the GS1 Global website. But um, a lot of companies use that database to validate the ownership of, of G10s. It might be an interesting thing to, uh, to also, you know, 
encourage people to take their third party UPC codes and, and use the tool to look it up and see who, yes. who you know, what, what company comes up. One thing I didn't mention, and I don't know um, if it, you know, we could help this out. There's no way GS1 can change it over if they do find that they are, you know, have a, it could be that it's a company that is out of business now. Um, and we get that question a lot too. Can we just switch it over to that company? And we can't do that. Right. right. So. Makes sense. And uh, so so I've certainly noticed but uh, that it's become a, a lot easier for smaller companies with, with, you know, essentially one product or just a few products to get started. Whereas a few years ago, it was a it was a, a much bigger commitment um, than it is now. Can you can you elaborate on that? Yeah. So, um, you know, GS1 has been um, authorizing or in, um, providing um, G10s for many, many years. So again, we've been around for 50 years. Um, but for a long time, we only provided them in, in bulk quantities that were um, that maybe some of the smaller sellers didn't, um, you know, didn't need. Um, so one of the things that we've done is we've adjusted our offerings over the years, listening to the market, understanding how the markets change, where a lot of smaller sellers are coming in and just trying to launch one or two products just to see if they'll they'll be successful before they grow their business. Um, and so uh, November of 2020, it's been almost two years now, we launched what we call our single G10, especially for those smaller sellers, um, so that they could come to GS1 and get one or two G10s if they need or a handful. Um, and then through GS1 US, we would license those. They are they still um, are reported in that database that I was talking about. We give a, a certificate of ownership and it, it allows those smaller sellers to play just like the big brands. And um, it's $30 per G10, uh, no renewal fee. So that's another enticing feature. Whereas if you do buy those, uh, the blocks of G10s, there's usually an annual uh, renewal fee. Um, so it just made it easier for those small sellers to launch their products um, at, a, at a, an affordable price. So $30 once and it's their G10 for life. Yeah, and that's fantastic. And uh, and if if somebody does that, is there an upgrade path where they you know they can go into the the you know obviously when they expand their business and they expand from from one product or two products to you know fifty or sixty can they can they migrate that into the the, the more the bigger um, packages? Right. So um, like I mentioned, we have um, multiple packages where you have the single or you a bulk quantity of either 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000. So those are the, the prefixes where then you could build off those um, capacities. Um, to, we don't have like an upgrade path. So once you license a G10 or a prefix with us, that's yours. Um, that's the members. Um, but if they want um, to grow their business or if their business is growing and they want to add more G10s to their um their master data files, uh, they would have to come back and get an additional prefix or an additional set of um, single G10. So we always say when you, you're you coming to GS1 to think about your business and where it, it, it will go maybe in the next three to five years, think for expansion. Um, so you don't have to keep coming back. So if you know you're only gonna launch a handful of products and that's gonna be it for a while, the single G10s might be a good option. But if you are going to launch, say, 10 products and then think, OK, I'm going to expand this into other colors and variations and within the next two years, you know, you might want to actually think that the, the prefix might be a, um, a better option for you. Um, it gives you that ability to grow your business, and not have to come back for additional prefixes. So it's really a business decision. Um, and we have some calculators uh, or a, a calculator on our website to help you with that, thinking about like product variations, how many products you think you might have to help you make that decision versus a single versus the different prefix capacities. Okay, that's great. And and of course, I mean, it's easy enough uh, on the part of packaging. If you decide to go to a, a block with prefixes, you can always just change the the, the, the GC or the UPC on the product into what you, you know, into the, the new block that you're using. Right. So if so the one thing is, is once you assign a product identifier to an item, it should stay on that um, that item and you should not change it. So part of the G10 management rules, um, you know, it doesn't, you could have multiple prefixes to your company and it still associates. So um, it doesn't, you shouldn't change that product identifier on your product, but you could add it from a different prefix on other product lines. Hopefully that okay. makes sense. Yeah. But once your product's in market, you really shouldn't change that um, identifier on it. 
because then you might have two identifiers for the same product, which causes confusion. Right. So then you would either have to like upgrade the product to the next version of it or something like that, and then you, then you would give it a new UPC anyway. Correct. And the uh, prefixes, are those customizable or is it just a certain prefix that you guys have kind of already chunked out? Yeah, we um, issue prefixes from a, a pool and we issue them randomly so um, that we could make sure that there's no bad actors out there trying to, to kind of figure out how the next one might be so they could use it. Um, but we have a, a pool of prefixes that we license out of. All right, well then, so then if an Amazon seller is... Uh thinking with just getting the UPC codes that are, you know, not necessarily GS1, what are some of the pitfalls that they could potentially run into uh, along the line? So what we've seen is if um, sellers go to a, a, a third party to get their, their UPCs, uh, sometimes they will slip through and be able to be listed. I'm, sometimes I don't know how it gets through, but they can. But what sometimes also happens is they'll, they'll launch their product. They will put that uh, GTIN on their product and um, for pay for packaging and then find out that they can't list with that non-GS1 barcode. And then they'll have to, one, come back, come to GS1, get their barcode, and then have to repackage, relabel their product. There's a lot of costs associated to that. So again, just, you know, be mindful, make sure that you're right, making the right business decisions for your company. Um, but also understand that, you know, uh, you may think you're saving money in the uh, up front, but it may end up costing you a lot more in the end. So, which we, we've, we've had to help some many sellers through and it's, it's frustrating. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it's kind of like anything else. I mean, if you buy cheap, then you know the quality is is. I mean, you you want a lot of risk there. Uh, I've I've you know in the beginning when we did it and we bought blocks of UBC codes from third party providers. You know, you you would try to use them on Amazon. It would look like it was going to work in the beginning, and then suddenly something went wrong, and then um, you had to start all over. And you know, and you don't find out right away, so you also burn through a lot of time. Um, whereas if you have a, an official code, then it, it always works. Right. Um, some other, um, I'll say some other challenges that we've seen um, in the market just to, that some Amazon sellers may have. They may come to GS1 and get their, um, their GTINs from us and then go to list and they might get an error on the platform that the product already exists. And there could be a couple of different root causes for that, but one of them is um, there might have been a bad actor out there that did um, like what we call G hijacked their G10. So um, especially before, say, Amazon put a lot of the, um, the checks in place on their platform. And so there might be an illegitimate um, uh, user of their G10. And, and we run into this um, quite a bit sometimes with uh, members. Um, it gets frustrating, um, but uh, we do have... Uh, some support. Luckily, if you do have um, the GS1 company prefix showing you that you're the rightful owner and you do run into that G10 hijacking situation, um, the Amazon selling partner support um, team can help you. You provide your GS1 company prefix and they'll usually uh, help you list your product and remove that bad actor. So um, sometimes we've, we've helped members through that scenario as well. That's awesome. So that's kind of like another layer of brand protection on top of Amazon's brand brand registry system and their transparency system, all that kind of stuff. It's kind of another uh, additional layer that uh, that people not, might not be thinking with. And it costs very little to implement that if you do it from the beginning. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So um, I'm just trying to think of some other things that when we work with some of our sellers, some of the issues that they run into and the advice that we give them, a lot of them, again, they have um, a problem with initially listing because they don't know which one to pick, the G10, EAN, or UPC, uh, the G10 hijacking. Um, we also find, and this isn't really related to GS1 standards per se, but um, a lot of times they um, will help sellers through other errors. And I don't know, um, I know this is what a lot of the community does, but, um, brand, you mentioned brand registry. Sometimes sellers will, because they they list with their company prefix company name, but then they may have a different brand name. So sometimes they might get um, like errors that their details don't match. And it's usually because 
it's looking at the company name, not the brand name. So using brand registry or providing Amazon all the brands that you're selling within your um, your corporation um, is also uh, another useful tool that we we've had to help sellers through that that scenario as well. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, for 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 sellers who are actually serious about expanding their brand and actually having a longevity um, for that brand and and potentially even selling it. Um, all having all of this in place is going to be super vital for them to actually be able to survive the long run. But also then if they're going to exit, they're going to exit with uh, some, some additional confidence or additional stability for the person who's buying that company. Yep. Yeah. And we that's always awesome. think, we always think to, you know, a lot of sellers start on Amazon and that's a great place to start. And that's, you know, uh, fairly easy, get your product noticed and launched. But again, think about growth and think about expansion. Do you want to uh, grow into other retail channels, other retail platforms? A lot of the other retailers out there, like the the big box names that we know and love, um, all use uh, GS1 standards. And so at least starting off with that product identifier, you're starting off already with a good start because they're just going to be able to be used again on other retail channels. And then using that prefix can also help you with other, like I said, other business uh, standards as you expand into, you know, logistics and, and fulfilling your products in, in uh, distribution centers with other retail channels. The GS1 standards are used widely in there too. So that's perfect. Yeah. Cause we have, a, there's a lot of talk about Walmart right now. A lot of talk offs, obviously with Shopify. Um, and then of course getting it into target or any of the other big stores. Um, Yep. Yeah, it makes it a lot easier. That's where the yeah. UPC is really shining. Yeah, for sure. Yep. So, awesome. And we're, we're always here to help. We have a, a lot of uh, resources to help those sellers, not just with product identification, but as they grow their business, how we could help them with other standards as well. So we have our GS1 US YouTube channel with lots of little videos, short videos that can you know help, uh, again, explain some of the standards in a little bit easier way. Um, we have our learning management system. Again, lots of lots of resources to help these sellers to work through some of the complications of uh, how do I figure out what to do. So, right, yeah, and also once uh, once somebody gets a a, a GS one a G ten, you know, there's a management system in there where you can keep track of everything, and you can easily get the the, the barcodes and all of that stuff. So all of that is tied together really nicely. That's actually a really good point. Thank you um, for reminding me. Um, yeah, when a seller comes to GS1 US to license their G10 or their prefix, we do offer them that GS our GS1 Data Hub tool. Um, and like you said, uh, it takes a lot of the the logic out of building your UPCs, especially if um, you get the prefix. It you know it constructs it, does the check digit, all the algorithms that most companies you know how do I do this? We do it for you, so it makes it easy. Um, and then you can take that data and, and then you know, add attributes and then use it to help you build your product portfolio and, and share it with trading partners. So, good call out. Yeah, it's a good, always good to start kind of with the right basis because it makes future headaches not, not actually appear. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, a uh, question that I know is going to be coming up. Um, if you have people are selling on Amazon and they are currently using UPCs from some random website where they bought, let's say a hundred or a thousand UPCs for $10. Um, and they have their sound, they're selling, you know, just fine on Amazon right now. What would be the easiest or best way to go about either changing those or not? What's, what's kind of the advice on that? So um, there's a lot to, to consider in that scenario. So, um, and especially if you're, um, that seller is doing fulfilled by Amazon. So if there's inventory that, that is already in the warehouses, it gets a little tricky. So if we're talking specifically about Amazon, because it's no. really hard to change um, identifiers on a product, especially if they have um, inventory in their, in their warehouses. So um, it, again, it, it business decisions if you choose to if you're in that scenario and want to move over to a gs1 um, identifier uh, you have to also think about relabeling and repackaging your products do you have inventory and where is your inventory do you have to relabel that 
Um, again, if Amazon it's in their warehouse, it's really tricky because they are not going to pull it and relabel it for you. So, um, so that there's, like I said, it just depends. It depends on the scenario. Um, it's doable, but um, you have to consider, you know, all the different aspects of where's your inventory, who has it, um, packaging costs. Um, it might be, you know, best to like switch it over when you are bringing in a, you know, a new shipment or replenishing yet that item. So, um, things to consider. And then Amazon does have a process if you do want to change that GTIN. But again, you have to make sure you don't have inventory and then you work with selling partner support to, to move that over so that all your customer reviews and all of your, you know, your history goes with it too. So it could get, it'd be a little, it could be a little complicated. It's doable. It's just, there's a lot to consider. Yeah, and it kind of depends how how it's being labeled as well. I mean, many Amazon sellers, especially in the, uh, in the private label, um, a brand's uh, space, um, they don't even put the actual UPC code on the bar. They put a Amazon's identifier, the FNSKU, uh, that's the barcode that's on there. So if they don't have the UPC on there, then it could be a fairly uh, painless transition as long as you you know use Amazon's process for changing the UPC. But if it's printed on there, yeah, then you have a, a, a much different issue that you have to work through. Interesting. So if you do have, um, so let's say your brand is, is, is you're, you're going to go into Walmart, or you're going to go into somewhere where you actually need a GS1 code. Um, you theoretically could go through the process of changing your UPC code to this new GS1 code, but you wouldn't be able to do that if you had stock at, at Amazon. Is that well, right? You can if it's not labeled with the UPC code. So Amazon gives you a couple of different options. You can either send stuff in where the UPC code is what's on there, or you can have an FNSKU barcode on there. And it kind of depends on whether you're commingling inventory or whether you are making sure that there's only your inventory that's assigned to you, which is where the FNSKU comes in. Um, so it depends how you how you started out and how you set it up and how you labeled your product. Um, so so yeah, you, you kind of have to look at where are you at, the and then, then you can decide you know, how, yep. how can you go from there. Yep. Um, I know that I have a couple products that are that use the FNSKU, and I know that they do not have GS1 codes. So I'm just trying to think with how would I go about changing these over, right? So. I could go through that process of changing the UPC um, with Amazon because I am using FNSKU and then get the GS1 codes. And when I do go into Walmart or some other store, I would then have to make sure that my new packaging had that GS1 code on it in addition to the FNSKU or in place of? No. So, I mean, uh, anywhere else uh, other than Amazon, I think you're always using the UPC. Uh, with Amazon, they, they want to see either the UPC or they want to see the FNSKU. And typically, if you're using the FNSKU, you either print that directly on the packaging or you, lab you have a label and you put yeah. it on top of the UPC code so that you know the UPC code can't be seen and now you're only seeing the FNSKU. Yep, exactly. So, and, and Walmart and other companies don't accept the FNSKU. Right. So they, they look the UPC. Right. Philip's okay. Philip, you're hired. Yeah, right. <laughs> nice. Okay, cool. Um, great. Well, I think that pretty much answers my questions. Um, anything else that you have on your mind on that? or? No, this is a great overview, and it, it, yeah, I certainly appreciate clearing up the terms on this. This is always kind of the first thing you want to do is you want to make sure you understand the words, and then, then you can kind of go build on that and, and understand the processes behind it afterwards. Um, but yeah, no, I think we've we've answered the questions that we that we hear on this. Awesome. Anything else that you want to share with us about this that I uh, haven't necessarily brought up? No, I mean, I, like I said, I think um, I highlighted some of the the things to think about and some of the errors that some that we've encountered. A lot of our members running into. Um, I, John will have will have make sure that we provide to you the uh, links to any resources that we've mentioned, such as our YouTube channel. Um, it, again, great places to have uh, resources to explain it a little bit more if there's still confusion. Um, but also, you know, other how to um, expand your business and use other standards, especially if you're going into other retail channels. 
Love it. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Michelle. Um, it was a pleasure having you and, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, we'll, um, we'll say our, our goodbyes for now and, uh, we'll see you guys in the next podcast. Thank, thank you. you for having me. Bye-bye.